In this video, we will take a look at some common oxidizing agents and some of their properties. We'll start with probably the most common oxidizer. Uh, the one that we're the most familiar with and is the responsible for most of the oxidation that occurs on planet Earth, and that is oxygen. Now, oxygen is a compressed gas or, uh, or um, you know, commercially or uh, can be found in our atmosphere. Uh, DOT places it in class 2, that is uh, compressed gases, division 3, uh, oxidizing compressed gases, oxygen. Um, as a gas, it naturally exists as O2, so um, those oxygen atoms pair up with each other naturally. On its own, it's not flammable. Oxygen will not burn um, absent any fuel, uh, not even in high concentrations. Um, and what we know about it is that while well, it's colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless, it's our most common oxidizer found in air, which is why all things that we see tend to point toward it um, in terms of combustion reactions. And the other thing that we need to know about it is that it makes up about 21% of our air. Uh, the majority component of our air, as you know, is nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up almost 80% of our air at 78%. Um, and um, oxygen makes up uh, you know, a good solid fifth of the air content. Now, as far as oxygen is concerned, oxygen is actually a relatively poor oxidizer. Um, in our list of oxidizers, in terms of their overall strength of oxidation, um, what we'll find is that oxygen is actually over here on the weaker side. Why do we spend so much time talking about it? Well, because of its prevalence. It is so common, it is so remarkably utilitarian and useful that even in some of these other subjects, ozone, peroxide, chlorates, nitrates, we will often find oxygen being brought up as a byproduct of that decomposition, of that reaction, um, which allows it to continue to combust and, f and fuel fires. Uh, but on its own, relatively weak oxidizer. Um, but let's talk about some compounds that do contain oxygen that are kind of in a class of their own, and that is peroxides. Now, peroxide is any substance that contains this kind of rare oxygen to oxygen single bond within a given compound. Now, why do we look for this particular bond? Well, because this particular bond, this oxygen to oxygen single bond is relatively unstable. And as an unstable substance, it's also quite reactive, which means that it's going to be very easily broken and is going to seek other kinds of materials, substances that are going to react with it and break that single bond. Now, for organic peroxides, again, the, the word organic here, meaning that we're talking about substances that are um, hydrocarbon-based compounds, what we're going to see is that this peroxide bond is found in the middle of these organic structures. So here I've got an organic peroxide um, set up this way, where I have a hydrogen on one side and a hydrocarbon on the other. Here I have a situation where I've got hydrocarbons on both sides. Now, how do we get these compounds? These are usually formed through an oxidation process. So if I take a substance like an ether, an ether you see has a hydrocarbon base with one oxygen forming a set of single bonds on either side. And ethers are relatively stable, although they're usually quite volatile. But what happens is the oxygen more or less inserts itself into the reaction to create this organic peroxide. And then the organic peroxides are unstable on their own and when they decompose, what we see happen is this oxygen to oxygen double single bond breaks and the resulting substance takes on kind of a new form. Um, what happens in this case is that this actually starts to rearrange itself. We end up getting alcohol and oxygen. And so we can see that in 
these kinds of decomposition reactions, what we get as byproducts of that decomposition are fuels, alcohol in this case, and oxidizer, which would be oxygen in this case. Uh, and so that's why organic peroxides are dangerous. That's why they actually get their own subclass of materials inside of the class uh, five uh, uh, oxidizers category. So moving on to some other kinds of peroxides. So hydrogen peroxide, for example. Now hydrogen peroxide looks exactly like an organic peroxide. The only difference is that instead of hydrocarbons, on either side of that oxygen to oxygen to single bond, we have just hydrogens. So there's no organic component here. And because of that, when hydrogen peroxide decomposes, we don't have a fuel left over. All that we get out of it is water and oxygen. So its decomposition is not nearly as dangerous as a uh, organic peroxide, but it still does have some interesting properties. Now, as we saw in the previous video, hydrogen peroxide is represented in all four classes of oxidizers, depending upon its concentration. And so some common places where we see hydrogen peroxide in the 1% to 3% range, we see it as antiseptic for cuts. This is your brown bottle peroxide that you find at a drugstore or at a Walmart or something like that. At 6%, this is where we see it bleaching. Um, and this is what cl classifies as a weak oxidizer, um, class one. Um, we would find this at places like hair salons or something like that. At 30%, we get into the moderate oxidizer range. And we see it used in industrial processes for bleaching purposes or to help us to create organic peroxides. And then at high concentrations, explosive concentrations, that's where we see it as a rocket fuel. This is where we can actually see it used by rockets and, and uh, uh, shuttles to uh, act as a propulsion agent as well as uh, a combustion agent for, um, for moving those rockets through space. Now, what do we know about hydrogen peroxide? Well, we know that it has kind of an irritating odor associated with it. We also know that it will slowly decompose over time to form hydrogen, or excuse me, form water and oxygen. That's why if when you buy a bottle of hydrogen peroxide from the store, it has an expiration date on it. The expiration date isn't just a, you know, kind of a cute guess. Um, it's, uh, it's a based in reality. The fact that this stuff will decompose over time. And if you open it up and hear a large hissing sound, well, that hissing sound that you hear is actually all of the oxygen escaping. Uh, there's a good chance that you have lost a good bit of the concentration. It might still bubble up. It might still work as an antiseptic, but will not be nearly as effective. Um, this decomposition process is catalyzed by sunlight. Uh, UV light will cause this to happen more quickly. So it is stored in brown bottles for that reason. And we also know that at higher concentrations, greater than 20%, we can actually see skin irritation and blindness caused um, if it comes into contact with those organs. Now, in addition to peroxides that are organic or hydrogen based, we also want to make note of some metal peroxides. These metal peroxides, uh, which again, feature that same oxygen to oxygen single bond, now just bonded to metals instead of non-metals. Um, where we see these primarily are with alkali and alkaline earth metal atoms, uh, metals. Uh, so you're talking about group 1A, group 2A, the first two columns of the periodic table. And these substances react in a kind of a similar fashion to what we've seen uh, out of hydrogen peroxide. We see decomposition to form oxides. 
so calcium oxide, for example. Um, we can also see reactions taking place where um, the uh, peroxide will react with water. And when it reacts with water, it forms a base, uh, sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, whatever the case may be, and oxygen gas. Uh, so this is particularly dangerous uh, as a solid because we're getting a caustic material, something that is corrosive, and we're getting oxygen gas, which can act as an oxidizer and potentially fuel a fire. So metal peroxides are interesting. Um, they're not terribly common, uh, but they are quite reactive uh, and very unstable. The other class of materials that we're going to want to look at today are the hypochlorites. Now hypochlorites, um, and hypochlorite refers to an ion, OCl minus 1. And when this ion is attached to metal compounds, in particular sodium metal or calcium metal, what we find is that that hypochlorite ion is a solid phase material that is a great bleaching agent. Um, and it actually makes up a good number of commercial bleaches and what we think of when we hear the word bleach. So take, for example, sodium hypochlorite. Trade name for sodium hypochlorite um, is Clorox, which is available in a 6% solution, 6 grams of sodium hypochlorite for every 100 grams of solution. There's another brand name called Hazachlor, um, which has a range of 10 to 12.5% sodium hypochlorite. And this is what we would commercially, this is what we think of as bleach. When we talk about bleach, um, just, you know, in general, we're thinking of sodium hypochlorite. Um, and what do we use bleach for? Well, we use it to sanitize. We use it to disinfect. That's the primary purpose of those. And so generally speaking, bleaches, uh, hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite bleaches are used for surface sanitation. Um, what we'll see is that the other example, the calcium hypochlorite, trade name HTH, it is used on a much larger scale. It has a much higher degree of bleaching power. And for those reasons, it is largely used for large scale sanitation. So we're talking about sanitizing drinking water sample and supplies, disinfecting swimming pools, um, getting into sewage treatment facilities. That's what these are all about. And so HTH is commonly used for those purposes. Now, in addition to hypochlorites, there are some other chlorinated salts that are also used that have the same kind of purpose. Uh, the dientrichloro, isocyanuric acids and salts. When we think of dry powders uh, or tablets that are containing chlorine bleach, these are the substances that are doing so. And so we have them avail uh, in either powder or tablet form. We can see them in things like dishwashing compounds, dry bleaches, detergents, scouring agents. And these are also responsible for the industrial sanitation products, especially the ones if you have ever had a uh, pool or a hot tub and you use those tablets to help to clean the water, help to disinfect the water. These tablets are usually one of those two isocyanuric acid products. And so that concludes for us our look at um, some of our more common oxidizing agents, and that is, again, oxygen gas, the peroxides, and the hypochlorite bleaching agents. Uh, in our next video, we'll actually look at some other uses for oxidizing materials, especially related to fireworks and explosives. Have a good day.